I want to begin by telling you two stories and see if they give us some hooks to get us into the gospel reading for this morning. The first is from a lot longer ago than I thought it was, 21 years ago when I was a youth leader in another parish. It can't possibly be that long, but we took a youth group trip to Assisi in Italy. Every other summer, there was a major pilgrimage trip with the high school youth group, and that year it was going to be to Italy. This was a, a fairly conservative area of the, the south of the United States and then suburban parents. So immediately their first thought was, our kids are going to go to Europe and get drunk. And so we had many, many meetings to talk about what our, our community standards were going to be when we were on this trip. How are we going to make sure that everybody was safe and everybody did what they were supposed to do? And in the end, we decided that to keep this as clean and simple as possible, no one would drink anything while we were on this trip. No alcohol. So we got to Italy, and we landed in Rome, and then it was a bus trip up to Assisi that took several hours, harrowing trips through tiny little towns with roads that were about this wide. And we finally got there, and we were all tired, and we had a nap and got up and went to dinner at a restaurant that had been all prepared for us. Our host had set this all up. We walked in, and on the table, there were bottles of red and white wine, already open and ready to be drunk. Because, of course, in Italy, that's what they assumed you would do when you went to dinner. And so all of our planning just totally went out the window. <laughs> the tables were already set. Now, I will say, just for the sake of being on YouTube, and this will last forever, we didn't actually drink any of that wine. It just gives me nightmares to imagine that the kids who went on that trip are now 40, but that's a whole other story. That's one story. The second story is more recent. It's from my trip just this summer to Europe. You know, I've been eating and drinking in hotels in Europe for most of my life, and I remember what you get. I mean, European hotels are much more gracious than American in general as far as breakfast. You don't have to go and drop 30 bucks to buy some halfway decent thing for breakfast. It's all laid out for you. It's a huge buffet of meat and cheese and fruit and yogurt and everything you can imagine. What had changed this time that I began to notice is that travel has become much more international. And European hotels have begun to notice who their customers are and are beginning to provide different kinds of breakfast food in addition to what you would expect. I'm thinking of a particular hotel in Vienna where we stayed, uh, where I think almost all the other guests were, were from Asia, Chinese and Japanese and Korean tourists. And so at breakfast, in addition to all the European stuff you would expect, there was a whole Asian section of salad and soup and noodles and other things that they would eat for breakfast, typically in those countries. It really struck me that it has become both a good thing and a bad thing, the way travel has developed. On the good side, wherever you go, you can probably find something that's familiar to you. It's comforting, especially early in the morning when maybe you're not feeling quite so adventurous at the same time, it, it's possible now to travel the world and never really have to engage with wherever you are because it'll feel just like where you're from. Someone was saying to me after 8 o'clock this morning that that's one of the things that she doesn't like about Vienna, where this hotel was. It, it's become such a, a standard international city. But in any case, breakfast was very much on my mind on this trip, and I was interested to see what the options were and to try other people's breakfast food just to find out what I might like or not like. So, two stories, which bring us perhaps to something of what's going on in the gospel today. We're now on our third week of bread, and maybe the fourth week of bread by now. And it may seem as if what the writers, the organizers of the lectionary have done is take every reference to bread and cobble it together into these Frankenstein monster lessons we're hearing where Jesus is always talking about bread. But that's not the case. These really do follow in sequence in the gospel. This is one long narrative from the feeding of the 5,000 through everything that Jesus is saying. You get a clue about that if you have sharp eyes. The beginning of this week's gospel lesson was the end of last week's. And the end of this week's lesson will be the beginning of next week's. So there's something going on here. There's a story being told what began as more or less an example of, of mass catering, feeding an enormous number of people, has turned into something deeper and more spiritual. As I hinted at in my sermon last week, what began as a story about what Jesus does 
has been transformed into a story about who Jesus is. And so somewhere hidden in there are some messages for you and for me about our relationship with Jesus, our relationship with God, God's relationship with the world, how we're supposed to live if we will just tease them out and perhaps chew on them for a little bit. No pun intended, it being another week of bread. So a few thoughts for you about where we may find ourselves as we begin now to get closer to the end of this this, this run of bread and the need to begin to figure out what the takeaway messages are for all of us. The first one is a little nerdy, but I'm the one doing the talking, so I get to do whatever I want. You may know that the Gospel of John is the only one of the four that has no Last Supper story. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there is a specific time, a specific place where Jesus and his followers are together. He gives them bread, he gives them wine, and he tells them to continue to do it. That's how we come to have the Eucharist. What we're doing here today comes from those instructions that the first followers of Jesus received. But there is no Eucharist story in the Gospel of John. There are some commentators who think this is because by the time the writer of John was writing, the the practice of the church was well enough established that there was no need to remind people of it. They were already doing it, so get on to more important than other things. Tell us something else that we didn't already know. There may be some truth in that, but I think there's a deeper message here. There's something that the writer of John wants us to see that I also hinted at in my sermon last week when I talked about how the, the, the message of Jesus is in everything that he does, not just this miracle or that clever story, but in the way he lived his entire life, the way he conducted himself day by day. I think there is something in the story that John is laying out for us that tells us about Eucharist communion with God, union with God, being something that we do all the time. Now, of course, it's something that we're reminded of that's made very present to us one hour a week when we're here doing this. But in reality, it's meant to be everywhere all the time. You may know that the word Eucharist comes from Greek words that mean thanksgiving. So all of our life, as the hymn says, all of our life is intended to be thanksgiving for the goodness of the Lord. Somehow this idea that bread comes to us along the way at unusual times and places is meant to be a reminder to us that our encounters with God happen all the time and that everyone else's encounters with God through us are also happening all the time. There is no limit to God's desire to be in union with us. There should be no limit to the number of times, the number of places, the number of ways we can imagine encountering God in the world, being fed by God as we go through the days and experiences that we have. That's a first important thing to remember. The second is why bread anyway? I suppose we've we've sort of danced around this for the last three or four weeks. Bread can seem pretty boring. Again, you go into a restaurant, and what do they do? They put down bread in front of you, and it's something that you eat mindlessly while you wait for the real food to arrive. Uh, When you make a sandwich, the bread is what's around the stuff that really counts, which is whatever you put in the middle. Now, there are snobs, as I suggested last week. I am one such person who like good quality bread and will not eat the cheap stuff if they can avoid it. Nonetheless, bread is, is there presented to us as the symbol in this case for a reason, I think. And the clue is in, hidden in the gospel lesson for this week where there's a reference indirectly to manna. You're, you're, what your ancestors ate in the wilderness, what Jesus is referring to is, is manna, the bread that was provided to Israel as they wandered in the desert for 40 years. It was strange. They didn't recognize it. They didn't know what it was. They had to have it explained to them. They had been complaining before this that God had brought them out into the desert to kill them because they were going to get nothing to eat. Then God gave them bread, and they complained about that too. We don't like this. It's all we ever get. This is boring. Hidden in there someplace is this message that the bread is there 
even in times of trouble, even in times when we're complaining about what it is God does or doesn't do. Regardless, the bread endures. We can expect to find it wherever we may go. God will have been there before us. That then leads to my next point, which is to say that the table is in fact already set. The people in the story this morning are complaining yet again, how can this guy do this? This doesn't make any sense. We, dear friends, do the same thing if we're honest with ourselves. We argue all the time about who is worthy to receive the Eucharist, who is worthy to be in the presence of God. There are denominations of the Christian faith that will not give communion to anyone who is not a member of their denomination. We argue all the time about what it even means that we somehow eat and drink in this place. And yet I think God chuckles and rolls the divine eyes just a little bit every time we do that because what we discover is that somehow the table was already set before we even got there. Somehow we are provided with everything we need before we ask, even though we may be unworthy, even though we may not even think to ask table is already set. We have only to come to it. Somehow in this little tiny thing that we receive, a tiny bit of bread, and it's a good, a good way, we complain all the time about using wafers or using tiny little cubes of bread, whatever we use. It's a good way to remember that whatever we may eat today is good for today, but we will still be hungry again tomorrow. And yet somehow it is enough, that tiny bit of sustenance that we receive, that tiny bit of food is enough to create community. We all come, we all receive the same thing from God. And that tiny bit of bread is also enough to give us eternal life. Which brings me to the last and maybe most important point. What is this eternal life thing? What is it and why should we want it? Probably you, if you're like me, when you hear eternal life, think of quantity. It makes sense that we would. Whenever we think of anything scarce, immediately the thing that comes to mind is quantity. We never have enough money. We never have enough energy. We never have enough creativity. But if we're honest with ourselves, the one thing that we really, truly don't have enough of is time. It is the one thing that runs out for every one of us. And yet that isn't the case for God. The best metaphor I could think of while I was thinking about this, about this this week is to imagine a billionaire who goes and buys a cup of coffee. It really doesn't matter how much your double caramel macchiato latte, whatever, whatever, I don't drink coffee, so whatever the most expensive cup of coffee is you can imagine, if you have almost unlimited money, it really doesn't matter how much that cup of coffee, coffee costs. God who is timeless, God who is eternal. For God, time is meaningless. There will always be enough, even for us, even for God's creatures. And so I don't think quantity is what Jesus has in mind when he's talking about eternal life. I think it's important that we look at it instead as being about quality. Again, back to being a nerd for a minute, one who has studied the Gospel of John will know that one of the key themes in it is the idea that the kingdom of God is already breaking into this world right now. Jesus and his followers say again and again, the kingdom of God has come near to you. What that means is it's happening right here among us. And yet those who are cynical will look around at the world and see it looks awful broken to me. It looks awfully imperfect to me. Where is your proof of this? This, I think, is what Jesus is trying to make his hearers understand. He's trying to make us understand. It's really not about perfection so much as about consecration. The idea that God has shared every one of our experiences, including hunger, God has been into every corner of our life, every corner of the broken, imperfect world that we inhabit. 
has brought the glory and the beauty and the, the majesty of God into every one of those places and blessed them. It doesn't mean they go away. It's not like they're obliterated. But somehow, as I say, God has been to every one of them first. And so that we go to them as well should not be a source of fear, but rather should be our hint, glimpse of eternal life. It's how we become Christ-like by bringing the holiness of God that we have already had poured out upon each one of us into all of those places. And in that way, somehow, what little piece of that holiness that we take away from this place every week, every time that we're here, multiplies. I said in my sermon at Beryl King's funeral, that miracles must multiply. They can't be contained. They, it's never enough. God is bigger than we are. This, then, is the ultimate message we take away from all of this talk of bread. Somehow it will continue to multiply. It will continue to be a blessing through us if we will only let it be. We who come week after week put out our hands and receive something that is small and yet that is enough. So, dear friends, I hope you'll look at bread differently this week. I hope you'll find the bread that is hiding in your life this week. I hope that somewhere, somehow, a little glimpse of the glory of God will be revealed and you'll be strengthened for the journey. Amen.